Um, the first lesson of zone design is that the technique will always fail you in the most inconvenient moment ever, like it usually does with any technical gear you are using. So my name is Anni Tolvanen. I'm a composer and sound designer and creative producer and folk musician and <coughs> a few other things from Helsinki, Finland. And I'm currently working as a sound designer for Reforge Studios, which is a mobile game um, company in Helsinki. And um, I have been LARPing since, oh my god, 20 years. Studied in 97. My first Knutpunkt was in the year 2000. I was 17 years old back then. But I have been doing music my whole life. So that's why it's kind of strange or weird that I only just very recently, meaning the la during the last couple of years, realized that hell, all this stuff that I have been doing with music my entire life, it kind of relates to this stuff that I've been doing with LARP for the last 20 years. Especially uh, my experiences from the folk music and world music scene, which is a lot about um, creating communities through music, uh, treating music and sound as sort of this shared... Um, like, the, the, as, as shared assets in a way, that everybody has equal right to own that music and use that music and how you also use jam session culture to create these super part participatory inclusive ones. <coughs> so probably around a year and a half ago I started really really figuring out that what is the overlap here and how how this might hopefully uh, benefit the Nordic large scene and I gave my first talk about the subject last year in Knutpunkt and then I was very lucky to be uh, invited to the LARP Writer Summer School last summer and then I really worked on the ideas and I worked on them even more. So I hope we'll... Um, I'm very interested in hearing afterwards what you think about these ideas. So we have obviously been using music and sound as part of LARPs since the dawn of time. Um, but very often we use sound and music as this sort of technical elements in our arts or kind of a mood creators and like well these are live musicians from uh, game well, arts games situations and then of course we might use sound effects through loudspeakers or we have we can have like theme music for arts that are used to signal that now something is starting and something is en ending and different kind of sound cues as part of meta techniques, somebody might uh, clean a glass in a meal and that signals that now there's this meta technique speech that's going to be used. So we are very good at coming up, or we have already been very good at coming up with different ways of using sound and music as sort of form of trickery or techniques. But what I started working on and thinking about was that when we talk about sound design for LARP, what is sort of the bottom level there? What is the sort of the ground floor? And what are the theoretical models that are at work there? And now I'm going to, during this speech, I'm going to introduce a few stuff that I have come up with and found out. These are not exhaustive theories in any way, but they are hopefully useful to some of you. Uh, first, just a very, very short introduction to sound, because to understand sound design, you have to understand sound. In physics, like many of you might know, sound is energy that travels through um, mediums like air or water as energy waves. And sound ca can be measured in many different ways. Um, for example, volume that's measured in decibels or frequency that measured in, that's measured in hertz that <coughs> defines whether sounds are really, really low or like super, super high. And of course, there's a range that an average human being can hear when it comes to both decibels and hertz. It's solved, but thank you, Magna. Mm -hmm. I love you. <laughs> um, now we have like five of these adapters sort of <laughs> <laughs> lined up here. Nobody else is there. Yes, I have, I have it all. Um, 
And then we have, is there any English speakers? How the hell are you supposed to pronounce mm -hmm. this word? Like something like timbre? Timbre, thank you. Uh, which is the tone, because I always say less timber, which is a different thing, obviously. But which is the tone color or tone quality. And meaning basically that if you have a horn and a violin that play the exact same frequency with the exact same decibels, you are still able to, or most people are able to, make the difference between the violin and the horn because they have the different timbre. And all of these, I'm introducing these three concepts because they are super relevant in solving certain kinds of sound design problems you might run into when planning sound for your LARP. Do you measure that? Or is that a, a judgment? Like? You can measure it basically, it's because no unique sound, like if you play a note from a violin, it's never just that one note. The only, only notes or like only sounds that have just one frequency um, are like sine waves and like not like the sine waves don't really exist in the universe so all sounds that exist are in fact a combination of different sine waves and have this sort of uh, overtone pattern stuff going on for them and that that overtone pattern pattern is what defines timbre and to a certain extent you can measure that pattern and that's an individual sort of fingerprint for the sound, if you may. But, of course, these are all physical parameters of sound. And for the purpose of LARP, uh, what's m way, way more relevant is, of course, how we as human beings perceive sound. And here is the same thing about physics. And then, to expand on it, in uh, physiology and psychology, uh, sound is defined by the reception of the sound waves and uh, like by the body, how we are physically able to receive the waves and also how our brain perceives those uh, signals. I will come back to this later on. Turns out our brain, at least for a sort of an average hearing person, uh, and as a disclaimer, uh, obviously I'm talking now, like all these things that I'm saying about how we hear stuff and how we experience sound, I'm operating with a sort of an average assumption of an average adult person's hearings. I know that some people's hearings might work in different ways for several different reasons, but um, just to make that clear that I'm aware that it doesn't necessarily work always this way for everyone. But for an average <coughs> adult person, our brain is really good at measuring different aspects of sound. Um, we will now do a test, and I would ask everybody to please close your eyes. And now, I am walking, and I'm walking as I'm walking, and I'm still walking, and I'm walking, and now I'm walking. And now, without opening your eyes, please point towards where I am. Now open your eyes. Now look around. And we take this as kind of for granted, but in fact, if you think about it, it's actually quite magnificent that our brain is capable of doing that. That you only need it to like you don't you didn't need to turn your head around to figure out where I was you could just sit there and listen and you immediately knew where I was and what I was doing everybody could hear that I went actually outside of this room and la la la, la. so you could track the events of that thing that my little jogging route just by listening to it and you could hear the distance whether I went further away whether I came closer you could figure out my direction, to which direction I was moving, you could, you could, if I'd ask, how long do you think that took? Most of you would probably make a very fair assumption, like whatever it was, like maybe 15 seconds or 20, I wasn't counting. But anyway, nobody would say that, yeah, I think that lasted like two minutes. And nobody would say that it lasted one second, because our brain automatically also measured the length of that sound. 
um, you could probably, if I'd ask you what different kinds of sounds you hear, somebody might mention that you could hear my uh, like my uh, bling here, <laughs> blinging together when I was sort of doing this. And again, your brain just automatically tracked all of that and made assumptions also, that even if you didn't pay attention that I'm wearing something like this, when you heard me that making that sound, you immediately came to a conclusion that, okay, she's wearing something that's making that sound. You didn't expect that sound to come from, I don't know, outside, or you didn't expect somebody in the front row suddenly taking out some jingle bells and playing with them because you knew that that was connected to what I was doing. Um, because all of these things were auditory patterns. You were able to follow the pattern of my footsteps, the pattern of my talking, the pattern of my jewelry. We could probably come up with some different patterns as well. If we had been like super really quiet and there wouldn't have been any background noise, you probably could have heard the pattern of my breathing and so forth. And all of these uh, patterns become inside our brain. This is, um, I'm a little bit sort of suspicious to talk about like music neuroscience because Toma, the our official neuroscientist is sitting in the middle of the room. But as far as I've understood it, this is all like super neurological. We have figured out that our, this is how our brain just handles sound. That uh, all of these patterns becomes uh, what we call auditory streams. And our brain is also extremely capable of making a difference between different auditory streams. For example, if we are very, very quiet for like five seconds. Most of you probably just suddenly paid attention to that there's actually quite a bit of background noise somewhere over there. But you weren't aware of it. Probably most of you weren't aware of it before we took that moment, because your brain is also magnificently awesome in dropping auditory dream streams that are not relevant to you at the any given moment. Let's imagine that you are in a small bar listening to a gig. You are concentrating on listening to the guitar player. Um, Somebody shouts your name from the next table over. You are immediately, haha, my that was relevant information. Your friend might be talking to you while you are listening to gig. You are paying attention to that stream. And maybe <clears throat> a dog barks outside and it sounds like your dog and you're like, wait, what was that? But at the same time, there might be traffic <coughs> outside. Um, you are not actively hearing the traffic. There might be drunken persons around you making shitloads of havoc like people do in a bar when they're listening to a gig and you are ignoring those two. Maybe in the next room there is not live music but there is like a radio playing music. You are ignoring that as well because at that moment that's not re re relevant information to your brain. Those are not relevant auditory streams. So your brain is just dropping them basically. You are able to hear them if there's some reason for you to sort of retune your brain that oh right there was traffic outside. Maybe there's an ambulance and then you are suddenly aware of the traffic. But until that moment, until you have the reason to listen to that, you are ignoring it. And for, like to summarize this up, how is this relevant to designing sound and music for a LARP environment, is that our perception of sound is in fact not measured by what we are physically able to hear, but what our brain thinks our hearing, or we, or we are hearing. And it's also very important to understand this dif difference that hearing something is not the same thing than listening to something. And listening to something is not, is not, say, is, is not the same thing. Did I say the first one wrong? Okay, so, and listening to something is different from listening for something. And what I mean by this is that um, in LARPs, we often use these different kinds of sound cues, for example, the signal that something is going to happen or there's background music or whatever. And as the designers, we often might make the mistake of thinking that it's enough to put the sound there and make sure it's loud enough. But that's not the case. If you are like super into some scene, you are not listening to those sounds unless you are given, to re given a reason to listen to those sounds. And more importantly, even though you would be in at some particular moment listening to a certain set of sounds, there's no reason you are listening for those sounds in the future 
unless you again given a reason. Like, um, let's say uh, I was playing the LARP inside Hamlet when it was ran in 2014, 15, whenever the last Hamlet was. And there was a problem of uh, they used um, music to signal cutscenes in the LARP. And because the space was relatively big, and there was a like it was an acoustically really challenging space because there were stone walls, there was a lot of echo, people were talking quite loudly toward loudly towards the end of the game, and the action itself was quite intense at times. So for many people, even though they were thought uh, taught before the LARP started that you should be listening for this theme music, it's like towards the end of the LARP it became harder and harder for people to actually register that, oh, now they are again playing the theme music. For several reasons, and I'm not going to the details right now, but just what I mean by that, that's the sort of... You have to be able to understand the difference here, that just making sound physically, like, hearable, <coughs> that doesn't still sort of promise anything on how people are going to react to it or are they actually listening to it or listening for it. And this brings us to what is sound design, because obviously sound design is something that we can use to design to do whatever we want to do with sound. Sound design is all around us all the time. Uh, most people, when we talk about sound design, think about something like this. We think about background music, we think about PA systems, or we think about like sound effects in movies, like gunshots, slidings, whatever. But sound, in fact, sound design exists in many places that you wouldn't necessarily guess it is. Uh, expensive cars, there's, I don't even know how many thousands of hours put into the sound design of an, of an expensive car door closing. Because that's one of your first experiences in, in interacting with that car is that you open the door. And of course, there's the mechanics of the handle that's part of it, but also the sound is very important to our sort of subconscious impression of that car. Um, there have been tests of toast that if the toaster gives the sort of this energetic pop when the toast is ready, uh, the toast will taste better. <laughs> Hair dryers, vacuum cleaners, there's a, it has to make a certain amount of noise. Vacuum cleaners, if I've, if I've understood correctly, could be made much more silent than they actually are. But the problem is that then the consumers think that they are not effective, that they are not doing their job. So you have to make them just loud enough for you to have the feeling of vroom, but not too loud so that you'd feel like super annoyed by it all the time. <laughs> yeah, and of course there are models that are sort of silent, but then you have to make it a real like huge advertisement point that these are silent, but they are still effective because our brain would want to think of them sort of for uh, to be less effective if they are not making enough sound. So in essence, sound design is the process of specifying, acquiring, manipulating, and generating audio elements to create intentional outcomes. And all of these parameters here, here I find extremely relevant to sound design for LARPs. And so far, I think, in the LARP scene, we are pretty good at sort of acquiring and generating sounds. Like just two players talking together are basically generating audio elements into the LARP. Right. And acquiring sounds meaning that, okay, somebody makes a playlist before the game and then it will be sort of played to the players in the game as in acquiring the music and then gen generating it from some loudspeakers in the game. Um, and sometimes there's even some specifying going on that we think about that what do we want to achieve with this playlist, of course. And sometimes there's manipulation, as in that we have some audio, like a DJ, for example. What DJ is doing, he's basically manipulating a certain playlist to create um, like interaction patterns, playing certain tunes, switching around between the tunes to sort of make the mood go to certain places. But where I think we could go much further in the scene is to think about the intentional outcomes that when we do 
these choices for our games? What are the intentional outcomes we are aiming for? And these, these two questions, I think, are questions that every LARP organizer, whether you think sound design matters in your game or not, I would obviously argue that it does, whether you want it or not. But these are the two questions that one could start with. Like, what kinds of sounds do we allow to exist in a space? And if your LARP has several spaces, you kind of have to ask this question for all of those spaces separately. And how do we want those sounds to behave in that space? When you are organizing a LARP and you think about sound design, this is where you usually start from. You have a site. And this is also where your sound design starts. Um, when I came to this room, my first sort of impression was that, okay, yeah, there are no microphone here, but it will be very easy to talk in this space, even though it's kind of low and long, but there are not a lot of, like, not, not too much. There's, like, for example, not a full carpet that will completely sort of suck out all the sound. It's probably quite easy for even people in the back to hear my talking and so forth. And I took that mental check. It took like five seconds of my brain power, or maybe even just two. But it was important for me to make that check. Um, of course, here I couldn't have done a lot about it. But if I would be running a LARP in this space, and I would sort of wish to use this room for a certain kind of interaction, I would have to probably spend even more than five seconds of thinking that whether the acoustic environment in this space actually supports the kind of interaction that I want happening in this space. Um, the more advanced level... Whoa. A more advanced level is to think about all sorts of different things, the different aspects of about... about the sound environment in any given space. Um, I not, probably don't have time to talk about all of this differently in a super deep way, but maybe a few relevant points. All the spaces you could possibly go to unless, unless they are in space, in a vacuum, and I so far haven't heard of anybody running a LARP in a vacuum. Maybe that happens, but not yet. But unless you are in a vacuum, there's going to be some sort of natural soundscape. We already did the five seconds of silence, people heard the people outside. Did somebody at that time notice any other elements of the natural soundscape of this space? The beamer. Yeah, the beamer. Ticking clock. Ticking clock. Yeah, somebody might have been moving around a bit and stuff like that, but that's still human-generated noise. But Every possible place has some sort of natural soundscape. I have a perfect example how you can ignore natural soundscape and how, how that can sort of destroy a design element, but I will go back, come back to it a little later on. Um, then stuff like echo and a reverberation. Rever the difference between these two are, I get asked this all the time, is that echo is basically I shout something, I hear something back. Reverberation is more like your sense of the space. And now even if, you, if you'd been brought to this space completely blind and you would have no idea what size of room you are in, the minute I start talking, each and every one of you would get impression of the size of the room. Because again, your brain just does that automatically for you. You don't even have to concentrate on that. So that's the essence of reverberation, to simplify it a bit. Amplification, whether there's PA systems, you can use, and if you use them, how should you actually be using them? I also come back to that uh, later on. And then one super important thing, auditory uh, audio masking, which means, and uh, this brings us back to the whole sort of volume and frequency and timbre, tam timbre of sounds, uh, that sometimes certain sounds, or very often, in fact, certain sounds get completely sort of muffled by the, in the presence of another sound. So when you have sounds that use the sort of cert same frequency um, areas or like, like that exist very close to each other in frequency and are very sort of similar in either volume or timbre or both, then one of those sounds may just completely 
disappear because this is still physics and these are energy waves and they are sort of competing with each, which, with each other. And it's a sort of a potential design failure for some that if you, for example, plan in a room that the, then at this point at the LARP, the king will come and make this epic speech. And you are maybe visiting the site and trying out, you go stand on a, some pedestal and you give out the speech to a completely empty room and you are like, yeah, this is, this is a piece of cake. And then suddenly you have 300 people in that room. And the acoustic environment has changed completely. And maybe there is like another activity going on on the courtyard that makes a whole lot of noise. And then the king starts speaking and nobody can hear him. And, and then most people, like players, tend to react to it that why can't he speak up? Maybe he's already speaking up, but the, the, just the audio environment, there are some other sounds that might be masking his voice. There might be too much echo for his words to get muffled because of the echo. Um, there might be, like again, some natural soundscape that is sort of disturbing people's attention at that time. And there might be off-game sounds that have nothing to do with the LARP and that will end up fucking up that thing. So thinking about these aspects of your game site is super in, in, uh, important because all of these have an in, impact on how your players will, will interact in that space. And I've been sort of trying to coin the term participatory sound design as something that I do and I think and... <coughs> With this, I mean communicating, or at least thinking about, as a designer, how are the participants expected to react and contribute to a soundscape in an environment? And of course, how to achieve that as well. But sort of, the, 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 again, like the first point of is specifying, like I said, the sound design is also specifying what you want to achieve. The first sort of step is to specify how you want want your participants to react to the sounds around them and how, how, how would you like them to contribute to that soundscape. Sometimes it's just that I want my players to come and talk and that's their contribution. But sometimes it's something more complicated and you might want to think about it a little bit. To help LARP organizers to measure the different aspects of this process, I am um, completely stole the concept of the mixing desk of LARP. How many of you are familiar with the mixing desk of LARP? Basically almost everybody in the room. So I, if you don't know about it, this is the time to take out, out, out your cell phone and Google it. Um, and now I'm going through the sliders <laughs> that I put into the mixing desk of LARP to help um, to, to sort of give you the, some of the tools or parameters that I've noticed that are relevant when designing uh, audio, any audio for LARP, whether it's just acoustics or like the King's Speech or background music or having some super amazingly elaborate med techniques that use sound as a tool. Uh, the first step in my list is Understanding whether your environment is completely acoustic, as in there's no artif <coughs> like there's no technology, no elect elect electricit electronic bleh, electronic gadgets that you use to um, operate with sound, or whether you use any kind of amplification, which would be the elect electrical gadgets, or sometimes I guess you could use some sort of old school horn. I don't know, but um, this is already where many. LARP designers kind of fail because very often we just think that okay this is a medieval LARP we are not going to use any PA and that's it and they just drop it there and they don't even think that even if your LARP is a completely acoustic that is still a design choice and you still will have that acoustic environment will have huge in impact on your player interaction and you have to figure out still how the sort of lack of PA and how the lack of any of like amplified technology, how that sound environment works in your LARP. And on the other hand, if you opt for using any kind of sound gear, you have to really think about why do I do this and, and, and like use this gear? Is it just that I've, if, because 
if you just think that I want to play music to the participants in this, or the LARPers in this party scene in this LARP, if you do not ask the question why I am playing the music, what do I actually want to achieve with that music, you are not able to pick up the right kind of gear for playing that music to them. Is like a small portable loudspeaker enough, or do you need like you do need to rent some actual professional gear to make all of your 200 players to have that party mode. So how that space works, even if it's acoustic or if it's amplified, and why are you making these decisions in this slider? This next slide, um, or the sl slider, is the exact same one than in the original mixing desk, but there is a huge difference in the how this manifests in a sound design. In the regular mixing desk, uh, 360 degrees um, basically is the what you see is what you get LARP environment, that you try to create as photorealistic LARP environment as humanely possible, and that's where you LARP, whereas the symbolic uh, environment representation might be going into a black box and sort of just imagining that we are in a manor house now. Uh, but when it comes to sound, it comes a little bit more complex because in fact if you want to create a realistic soundscape of a medieval village it's much easier to do it in a black box obviously because in a 360 degree LARP you'd need like cows and chicken running around and horses and and like blacksmiths and people sort of drawing carts through the village and all sorts of activities that, it, that are very hard to recreate in a LARP to create that soundscape. Whereas in a black box it's very easy or like relatively easy to create that 360 degree soundscape. So when it comes to sound design this is something that you can actually toy with, that you can create really kind of audio realistic 360 degree soundscape in an, envir like in an environment that is otherwise completely symbolic to LARP in. And, all, and the other thing, I've been in several 360 degree LARPs otherwise, where there were some sound design elements that were completely symbolic. The most used one is probably bang, 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 because you don't want to shoot real guns indoors, for example. So you have this meta technique that the bang, bang means somebody shooting a gun. Now, where this gets even trickier is here in the between, and this is my example of natural soundscape sort of fucking up some of your game experience. I had this experience years ago, I was this super authentic late medieval LARP. We were playing in the middle of a forest in southern Finland. It was a gorgeous site with these two small lakes and some epic like rocks leaning over this sort of medieval military campsite and it was the most beautiful night ever it was like a completely black starry night and the water was completely still and there were some swans swimming and then you could see the campfires all around the medieval like the military camp and by like 2 or 3 a.m most people were sleeping, so it was like dead silent. And me and some other characters were walking to like patrol around that camp. And all this time, we could hear the highway a couple of kilo kilometers away, which completely ruined the otherwise totally 360 degree <coughs> experience. Of course, it wouldn't probably destroy it for everybody. I'm kind of allergic to these kind of distractions, but there will be other players who have that reaction too. And sometimes, of course, this just might happen. You might find the perfect site and that the highway is there and you, there's nothing you can do about it. But sometimes what also happens is that when you go to check out your site, you go there in your modern day self or, and like your civil, the, your normal civilian persona. And then the auditory stream of the traffic is not relevant information because that's something that you are used to ignoring in your everyday life all the time. But in the context of the medieval military camp, that auditory stream is, a, is completely out of place. And then it becomes so much more, like so much harder to ignore. 
So when you as a designer pick, pick up your site and you think about these factors, this is something that you have to remember, that when we are in the context of this LARP, how we perceive the sounds around us will radically change. So you have to sort of go into that mind space and think about that, okay, but when I'm actually playing the LARP, what am I sort of expecting to hear then and what I'm expected to find relevant at that time? And of course, that's guesswork. But if you do not do that, you will end up ha having that highway next to your medieval camp. And yeah, I had like some highlights there too. Like, this is important. Uh, narrative role. This is something, the next three sliders, um, probably the most complex aspect of what I'm trying to explain. Um, because they, so all of them sort of overlap, which is also why this is where I've seen sound design in LARPs fail the most. And now this sound environment is disturbing our experience. On the um, diegetic versus non-diegetic. These terms I've stolen from uh, film, music analysis, of uh, meaning, and of course di diegesis was a huge thing in the Finnish LARP theory in the early 2000s as well. But to simplify it, this means in-game, this means off-game. <laughs> so diegetic sounds are sounds that exist within the narrative, whereas non-diegetic sounds are sounds that do not exist in the narrative. For example, if we are having an in-game dialogue, all of that is diegetic sound. But if I, for some reason, need to like tell you, like off-game, I need to, I suddenly have a cramp in my food and I need to leave this space now. That's non-diegetic sound. Or if somebody, depending on the game, if somebody uses a safe word, that's a non-diegetic sound, obviously. And or random off-game sounds. There are games where the random off-game sounds don't really matter. We are sort of <coughs> just ignoring them because we understand that the ambulance that just drove by, it has nothing to do with the slurp. We are not supposed to react to it. It's a non diegetic sound. But first step is understanding that which sounds actually happen inside the narrative and which don't. Now, the movie, the, the film music theory also has introduced this marvelous term called supradiegetic sound, which in a movie context means that, like, for example, a character starts to sing a song, and then some orchestra sort of just swoops in. And of course, the character might be singing the song within the narrative, but is the orchestra actually in the narrative or not? We do not know. Not really, we cannot see them. Is the character hearing the orchestra? We don't know. And this also happens in LARPs. Very often LARPs do use background music that it, where it's not really specified whether this background music exists in this narrative or not. Again, like in a medieval LARP, you might hide a loudspeaker that plays medieval music. But are the players supposed to, or the characters supposed to react to it so that, okay, there is this band somewhere and we just do not see it? Or is this supposed to be like this super diegetic background music. And defining this can be super important at some, like in, in some occasions. Like for example, in Inside Hamlet, in the third scene of that LARP, um, there had been this background track, background music track playing throughout the LARP, and in the third scene, the DJ started adding um, the sound effects of like gunfire and rioting on the streets to the, uh, the background track, because that sort of fitted the mood of that final episode of that LARP. But the problem was that the players didn't know whether they were supposed to react to those sounds, like, oh my god, the soldiers are basically like, I can literally see them from the windows, or whether it was there just for the mood, as in being the super diegetic sounds. And just communicating that beforehand would have saved a lot of people, a lot of players, some awkward confusion when you do not really know whether we are supposed to start this military emergency session to figure out how we are going to defend this castle or not, based on those sounds. Which brings me to whether, like the, the, the question of how your players are supposed to react to these sounds that they are hearing. 
And very often we just default to the, well, of course, people know that you are not supposed to react to that ambulance, but you are supposed to react to the safe word, and you are supposed to react to the bard that comes playing, but you are not supposed to sing along because there's this social construct that when somebody's performing, you're not supposed to sing. And in fact, this is not, we come from very different backgrounds. This is not evident. We have to figure these things out. So you cannot really presume that your players automatically know how to react to different sort of layers of sound information that are around them. Because sometimes, for example, it might be really hard to tell whether a discussion is in-game or off-game if you are in a modern-day LARP and you just bump into a room where two people are having an off-game conversation and you don't know they are off-game unless there's some sort of signal. And navigating this can get tricky. So I have made this chart. Uh, which will include the third slider, which I will show after this slide, because it, ma it makes more sense after this one. But because I'm also running out of time, I try to be super quick. But here you can see these, the first two slides sort of put together. As in, the, if you have to think about any individual sound or sound environment in your LARP, there's a difference between uh, diegetic versus non-diegetic, and passive versus active player response to the soundscape or an individual sound or whatever. And here, uh, well, let's actually start here. Obviously irrelevant off-game sound, that ambulance ru running by, you don't want the players to react to it. So you want the players to stay passive when it comes to this sound. And it's also a non-diegetic sound, so that's quite clear. -cut. Also, important in-game sounds like somebody, the herald runs into the room like, oh, the orcs are attacking. That's obviously audio information that is diegetic and you want players to actively respond to that somehow. Um, then there can be sounds that are non-diegetic sounds that you really need the players to actively react to, even though they're not non-diegetic sounds like safe words or if there's a fire al alarm non diegetic sounds that you players really need to respect for several reasons. And then, of course, there are shady stuff that sort of s switches around. And then I had a hard time figuring out sort of what would be that diegetic sounds that you don't want players to react to. If you come up with more ideas, please let me know. But for example, in-game taboos. There might be uh, in-game culture where, for example, shouting is a taboo, or like whatever sounds might be a taboo. Like in our <laughs> Western civilized social culture, for example, the sound of farting is kind of a taboo. That you are if you hear somebody farting, everybody sort of just politely ignores it. Uh, usually, I guess. <laughs> but like just a funny example from my everyday lives. So there might be some in-game sounds that for some reason you want to communicate to players that the characters are not supposed to react to those sounds. And then and this brings us to the third slider in this um, mixing desk is about observing and participating. Because you can put here also diegetic but active uh, like participation or being present in the LARP, like characters interacting each other, it's diegetic, it's active participation, uh, non-diegetic an active element of LARP is using different kinds of meta techniques. Uh, usually, meta techniques can sometimes also be diegetic, but to work with me here, you probably understand <laughs> how this different goes. And meta, and meta techniques that when other peoples are using meta techniques and you are not sort of part of that meta technique, but you may be required to observe it, like for example, if there's a cutscene. Um, and ca other characters' interaction that you are just, for whatever reason, expected to uh, observe instead of participating to it. I don't know if I'm making sense. I'm going to show this now. So this is kind of the third aspect of how we want the players to react to sounds. Like whether we want the players to actively participate to what they are hearing. Dun, dun, dun or whether we want them to observe what's going on. And this is what I, this is, I call this interaction frame. And I have these funny pictures here because I haven't shown you pictures in a while and you must be bored. So you <laughs> might have a sort of a 
control band playing rock music and you want the players to mostly just observe. You don't want your players to everybody go on stage with that band and play with them. They might be participating by sort of clapping along, but their role is still to be the sort of the observers of this performance. And on the other hand, you might have music or sound elements that you want and need to be participatory. Like you, maybe you have a medieval tavern in your LARP and you want in the tavern to be a bard who will sing all these drinking songs and you want everybody in that tavern to join along and have this sort of a rowdy tavern riot singing songs and dancing on the table thing. But your participants cannot really know whether, like for example, a musical performance is a performance they are supposed to only observe or whether it's something that they are encouraged to participate in unless you communicate it to them somehow. Especially because there are shitloads of social rules and learned behavior around these situations. And as, especially in the Nordic countries, we tend to sort of default to that we don't want to go mess up those people's things and we are going to just politely sit here and observe. And that might create really awkward mood in that rowdy bar if everybody just sits silently sipping their beer and the bard has to sing all the drinking songs alone. <laughs> so, these social rules and learned behavior always trump your design unless you use those social rules and learned behavior together with your design to create participation and interaction. And one way of doing this is think about moods. Uh, what kind of mood you need your sound environment to create for your players? And these terms come from, I can't remember where I stole them from, but they are like actual real science uh, of how, when we listen to any kind of soundscape or music, what are the sort of the parameters there. And this is a very cool toolkit for thinking about like, for example, if you are building a playlist for a LARP and you think about what kind of mood you need that playlist to create, instead of just going for that, well, I kind of like Queen's music, so I'm going to play the players a lot of Queen because that would fit the time period and la 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 la. Sometimes that's a valid choice. But I would argue that as a designer, you will get better um, results by not thinking about which bands you want to play or which which or which artists or which live musician or which DJ you want to come in. You should probably start from figuring out what mood you need that music or that soundscape to set for your players and then p making your choices based on first picking the mood. And of course these are personal matters. I know people who get super super relaxed by listening to some super disturbed like noisy, hardcore, mm, trash metal. But overall, like for example in film scores, we do have in the Western society certain like axioms of how do we react to certain soundscapes. And you can go for those um, like middle rounds. Because I'm running out of time, I'm not going to explain this slide at all. And here is, here is the whole sort of hassle of the mixing desk of sound design for LARP. And to wrap this up, uh, this will hopefully be available somewhere so you don't have to stare at it any longer now. Um, how to encourage, encourage participation then? Like after all of this, how, if you want your uh, players to in, like participate in creating whatever soundscape or singing in that medieval tavern or whatever, what, what, is your, what are your toolkits? These are of course more general concepts. Um, these work for other stuff as well. But all of these things matter. Expectations, like telling them what you are ex expected, having facilitators and workshops to teach people stuff beforehand and sort of lead the thing when it's happening. Access to <coughs> the material that you are going to be using, the feeling of responsibility that somebody is responsible for the thing going forward if it doesn't do so automatically. Low entry level, you can only participate by clapping your hands and that's a valid level of um, participating. Having a way to opt out, always. And 
I find these two basically in including the op out actually to be the most important stuff when it comes to sound and music. To be very clear of what you expect. If you want there to be an epic ritual where everybody chants along, it might be a short thing to say that, hey, by the way, we are having this ritual, please be mentally prepared to chant along. And then you will probably win an awkward sort of hassle in the beginning when people are not quite sure whether they are supposed to participate or not. And also make sure that your players understand the context, that when they join into that ritual, what are they actually joining? Like, are you chanting for Tulhu or, or I don't know, some, some other god or whatever? And what's the context in the in the in the game? So why why does this matter basically? And you can use all sorts of positive triggers, uh, like if people are more keen to join into something that they recognize, that have recollections of, and that have, that they have repeated. And also, um, when you have taught them something sound wise, then when you change the pattern a little bit. That's also a very effective tool, but you first have to sort of jump through all of these previous hoops. But this is, again, this is like real actual uh, music neuroscience, that this is just also how our brain works, like with the uh, auditory streams and stuff like that. And when we recognize something, um, we will just have a more positive reaction to it, and we are, we are way more likely to join in. Which, of course, everybody, like yesterday, um, who was in the KPTV program item, people started sing naturally to singing along to the musical numbers without any sort of encouragement because people recognized those tunes and it was fun to join in, so they did so. But if all of those songs would have been something that you have never heard ever before in your life, you obviously wouldn't react to them like that. And finally, it's not all about skill. Uh, this is also um, something that many people seem to think that to be able to participate to some sort of epic bar singing, you have to have some skill. Uh, but it's not about skill, even when it kind of is. Because there are always levels of participation that, participation that don't require you to be a master musician or epic sound designer, because it can start from as easy things as clapping your hands. Like most of us probably were in the opening ritual, it was very low key and there was really cool sound design going on and participatory sound design going on. Because the only thing it took was for there to be enough people that when you get enough of them chanting, the rest are like, ha, huh, I can chant along, this is fun. And even those who didn't feel like chanting didn't felt like that they were sort of betraying the, um, like the situation because there were enough people still sort of keeping it up. And it didn't took any skill at all, because they were facilitators, and the context sort of was provided, and the expectations of that context were quite clear to everybody, and so forth. And now to really wrap this up, sound design is not just a special trick you pull out of your arse, it's not just a special sound effect you put in a loudspeaker in the middle of your LARP to spook out your players. Uh, because always when we do sound design, any kind of sound design, it's for a specific space, unless you are in a vacuum, which technically also I think is space. There's an audience for that sound. We use some sort of toolkit to make the sound happen, and we aim for a certain outcome. And that's it. And we are 10 minutes out of time.